dun, dun, dun. <laughs> cool. Another free giveaway, you can all download Firefox for free. <laughs> <laughs> Even on Android, not on iOS, but you can all email Apple and ask for that. <laughs> So yeah, so we're here today to talk a little bit about um, Mozilla Boot Gecko project, um, some of the technologies involved in that, and um, basically what it means for the web. So my name's Rob Hawks. I'm one of the uh, technical evangelists at Mozilla. Um, primary focus on mainly on games, but I'm very much interested in uh, the Boot Gecko project and what's happening with the mobile space as well. I'm Chris Harmon, principal evangelist for HTML5 and Open Web at Mozilla. I'm working with Boot Gecko and with the identity team a lot. And I'm here for Google I.O. as well to talk about mobile development there a bit, uh, not as a speaker this time, so I can get presence, which is good. And um, yeah, we're gonna, we, we didn't rehearse that talk much. No. I was actually <laughs> training people all day long about public speaking, so it's going to be very relaxed and very uh, ad hoc, if you say so. Uh, so just quick gauging what you guys are doing. So who here would call themselves a developer? OK, uh, designers. <laughs> Project managers, own up. <laughs> Entrepreneurs, mobile developers. It's not like we're going to change our talk or anything. It's just <laughs> you need to have some exercise at the end of the day that makes you wake up. So we thought that's a good idea. But that means we have a mixture of everybody, which is good. Um, so we're here to talk about b Gecko, like I said. So b Gecko is um, commonly referred to as B2G. Um, and it's a, a full operating system and platform um, for mobile devices effectively. And it consists of uh, two major components. Um, you have the, the Gecko side of things and the Gaia side of things. The Gecko side of things is, the, uh, is mainly the hardware related stuff and like JavaScript APIs um, necessary to sort of get mobile functionality working. And so the Gecko side of things is basically everything that you don't really see. Um, you also have the Gaia side of things, which is mainly the front end um, visual sort of um, operating system. So it's everything that hooks into those JavaScript APIs that Gecko provides. Uh, so Gaia is effectively everything that you can see on the device. So the interesting thing about Gaia is that, well, first of all, Gecko is the engine that, that is in Firefox. That's the rendering engine, much like, uh, uh, much like it's Trident and the old Internet Explorer and these kind of things. And the really cool thing about Gaia is that for the first time, you have a phone system, a phone mobile system that is fully based on HTML5. That is not only an HTML5 layer on top of Java or on top of C Sharp or on top of Cocoa or Visual C or whatever you want to write, but it's actually the whole system itself, the operating system is written in HTML5 itself. And for me, that was really cool to finally take the 14 years of web development that I've done and see them on a phone without having to go through some conversion process or going to some other development process, but actually can hack around with some JavaScript and out of a sudden I've got an app on my phone. And that's an incredibly powerful thing to do because HTML5, when it came out, was this big thing. Like, oh, HTML5, HTML4 is so dead and XML is dead anyways and Flash is so dead and everything is cool now. And then we, we got really excited about it and then all of a sudden a few companies that said HTML5 is the best thing ever realized that they make a lot of money with native applications and not so much with applications that run in the browser and their browsers out of a sudden blocked us out and we didn't have the access of to the hardware that we have on a desktop on a mobile device, which was a bit of a shame because the, uh, the, how small the stack of HTML5 is compared to others allows us to build things really quickly and really small. So why B2G? Why is it important? And the problem is that uh, the right thing is that HTML5 and JavaScript are the underlying technologies of the web. Like we've come this far from linked documents in some institute in Switzerland and some universities in America to people that have day-to-day -day dealings with the web. I book my tickets over the web. I book my hotel rooms over the web. I, I, I couldn't think of it any more than, uh, I mean, I remember, like some of you might do as well, when you had to send letters for things, when you had to actually send. The other day I had a server in Germany that I wanted to shut down. I had to send them a fax to shut down my server. And that fascinated me that nobody has embraced it that much. But the technologies that we have here actually allow us to build things quickly. And especially getting people up to speed on developing with the web is a wonderful thing. And Mozilla 
We are a non-for-profit organization to keep the web open. That's quite a mouthful, and it's also quite a job. But it's a wonderful job as well. We have this Mozilla Thimble project right now where we teach kids how to build their first HTML pages and uh, uh, people like journalists how to actually put HTML5 video out there with subtitles and interact with, rest of, with the rest of the page. I've never seen a media before that is so easy to get into and that's why we wanted to keep that media alive also on uh, mobile platforms. So and it's created with open technologies and that's another thing that a lot of people don't really get why this is important. I mean it's very simple to say like yeah we're open, oh, no that's cool like we're open so we're not closed so we're not evil and that's just not enough. But open technologies means that you are in public. Whatever you do is scrutinized by millions and millions of people out there and you have the benefit of when they complain about it to tell them well help us fix it and not just like, oh, we have to fix it, two months time, don't worry about it. There's a lot of stuff to, uh, out there that's said is open, but it's, a lot of it is like not open source, but tada source, as we call it. So it gets released, tada, and then two weeks later you can get the source code and start playing with it. But you don't have a choice in actually building this thing together with the company that releases that open source. And with both with Firefox and with Boot to Gecko, we do it differently, which can be a massive challenge for us, because Boot to Gecko, in the start was eight months ago, an empty repository on GitHub. <laughs> so we said, we have put Boot to Gecko, we bring a, a no, another mobile OS out there. And all we got, me being in England and talking to the press in the morning was an empty GitHub repository. That was the first time I heard about that thing. And seven months later, I've got a phone in my hand running that. And I was like, wow. And it's a team of like four or five people back then with lots and lots of people contributing to it and building on other open source that is already out there. All of a sudden we have a competitor for the operating systems out there that is targeted to devices that couldn't run these new systems. I bought a Nexus S last year, the first time I bought my phone. Normally I get those things to test them out and never send them back, which is pretty good, or I go to Google I.O. <laughs> and, uh, but now a year later, Ice Cream Sandwich is too slow on the Nexus S. And that just fascinated me that this happens so fast nowadays. And not everybody can afford a new, uh, a new phone all the time, so we wanted to make a phone system that makes the web available to people who have not the coolest newest technology and there's a whole world out there of those people that should get the benefits of the web without having to pay through the nose for it. So why is it free technologies? And uh, a lot of people say that well, it's free, it cannot be good. It's like you, you, it can't be the right thing, but it's the same topic that I said before. Why would I have to pay for an operating system when, when a machine can run the things that I want to do with something that comes free because by definition we made it available to you. So part of Boot to Gecko is it's, an, it's another thing that we're doing and that's called Kilimanjaro. So, so yeah, the Kilimanjaro project um, or the Kilimanjaro event as we call it is basically a milestone across um, several of the Mozilla products that we've got going on. Um, and it's not like a, a single release, like it would be like a Firefox release or anything like that. It's more of like a, an incremental effort to sort of get to a, a, a point in time that we think we should be getting to. Um, so when we reach this Kilimanjaro event, which we hope will be later this year, um, we're hoping to have sort of like an elegant and simple uh, <coughs> solution for sort of uh, HTML5 applications um, within Firefox. So taking into consideration like what we've got with Boot2Gecko on the mobile side of things, um, our sort of um, identity and um, personalization services with Persona and Browser ID, then the Firefox desktop stuff as well, and also just tying that all together with web apps and that kind of stuff, which we'll cover in a little bit um, in a moment. So yeah, the idea is to sort of reach this by maybe September this year, um, but it, like I said, it's not just a, a product release, it's more of a sort of a consistent push amongst all these various different teams and products within Mozilla to sort of reach some sort of consistent um, end, end point. So um, just before we explain like like the inner workings of Boot to Gecko and some of the technologies and stuff. Um, the best way to sort of get you sort of um, to grips with it, I suppose, is to show you a demo of it. So um, I was going to show you a demo on the computer, but I'm actually going to show you a demo of the phone um, working with us right now. Um, so we've actually got um, these devices on us today. So if you want to have a look at these, like um, and actually play on them right now, um, just grab us after the talk and you can have a play. So yeah, I'm just going to quickly run through this. Um, maybe you want to sort of talk while I'm yeah. holding it. 
We're doing the clever thing with like showing the camera on the laptop and turn the laptop around to show your phone because there's just no way to show phones on a screen <laughs> in a simple fashion. So uh, what you see here is the, uh, what you maybe see here, uh, what you see here is a glaring screen with a finger <laughs> on it. And there you go. also see these icons. And uh, these icons are all HTML5 applications. And this is, for example, WebGL running on that phone with 60 frames per second. And we just pulled a random WebGL demo rather than understanding it ourselves because it's not that <laughs> easy. And all of these things are basically an index HTML page and a JavaScript manifest file, a JSON manifest file, that tells you what the phone should do with these applications. And we were at Mobile World Congress, the most, the biggest mobile conference worldwide. And when we showed that to people, they were like, oh, is that the Windows phone? Because it wasn't rectangular back then. It was like longer icons. And no, no, actually, that's HTML. As Rob just showed, this is a developer demo. So this is not for the end users. Yeah. Everywhere in the system, you can just hit the button and see the source code of the page that you're currently on there. This is the source code of the operating system itself. The whole interface is written in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. You don't need to actually flash a phone to get a different interface on that. It runs games. It runs all the things that you see on the web. My favorite is that we, so this is the dialer here. You can actually call numbers because it's incredibly useful to have a phone that to call other people. <laughs> Text messaging is probably a good idea as well. So this has all been supported. And what we've done here, we actually opened the stack uh, through JavaScript APIs that we all standardized, which we're going to talk through one by one later on as well. Really cool is also that we, I uh, don't know if the, uh, the cut the rope is going to run, run here. You got the not. Wireless, right? Oh, there we yeah. go. OK, there you go. The cut the rope is uh, basically an HTML5 demo game out there that is on the web. And it's written by Microsoft for showing off how cool Internet Explorer 9 is. <laughs> so we thought we can put this in an iframe and get rid of that Internet Explorer 9 logo and actually show how cool Good to Gecko is. Oh. So <laughs> this one is running in WebGL and Canvas, and it has the same fidelity that Cut the Rope has on Android, for example. On iOS, it costs more money, so you probably will not have seen those levels. <laughs> but it has the hardware acceleration on everything out there. And that was always the issue with uh, with JavaScript and Canvas that we didn't have the hardware access that we had in the past uh, or through other systems or with operating system browsers that come out there. And I'm looking forward to Google I.O. tomorrow to see what's happening with Chrome on Android as well because for a moment now, the Android browser is actually quite disappointing. Uh, what fascinates me here is the opportunities that we have as all of that is HTML. Even the settings menu, even the, 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 phone, uh, the, the volume control is just, a Java, it's just a CSS and HTML. So you can control that phone in any which way you want, and you can build your own interfaces. So we built that system. We're not going to release the phone. Don't ask us for phones because we don't have any on us. And we're partnering, actually, with mobile phone providers or mobile system providers to actually bring these phones into the hands of people. because. Some other, some other big company tried to bring out their own phones and do their own distribution. It didn't quite work for them. So a non-for-profit organization shouldn't try to sell phones. That's not the idea of that. Our idea is to bring the HTML world to mobile phones without having to go through an extra build process and go through extra um, length here. And you can see the fidelity is quite good. The fidelity is, we're still tweaking it. The scrolling is fast. We have multi-touch support. We've got all the things in there you expect from a phone. And it was great at Mobile World Congress because every developer we put it in there started scrolling really fast. Like, <laughs> it's not quite as smooth as an iPhone. And you're like, yeah, it only is like $600 less. And uh, every end user just looked at it like, oh, this is cool. This is nice. It has games. It has buttons. You know, like much like people, oh, this blue E is the internet, right? No, not anymore. <laughs> and it runs videos. It runs all the things that you expect from a phone as well. And we found so far when using it, uh, in like day-to-day -day life that the battery life is incredibly long because we don't go through the Java stack. We go and through, don't go through C Sharp. It's just a Linux core with the, the hardware drivers and JavaScript APIs on top of that, talking directly to the hardware. Look at that. It's got a dialer and everything. <laughs> it's like a real uh, phone. It is. So that's Boot to Gecko. And yeah, you can play with those a bit later if you want to. Cool. Yeah, so that's sort of the best way to give you an overview without explaining it too far. So um, 
there was a whole bunch of technology that Christian sort of um, touched on, and I suppose you want to sort of go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, the main thing, and Christian covered this briefly, is that the phone is built on the Gecko engine, which is what's behind Firefox. Now, so effectively, um, you could call this like a Firefox phone. It's a little bit more than that, but it's it's running on the same technology in the back end. So the idea is the, the features that we roll into Boot to Gecko will fall into Firefox as well, because it's all built on the same back end. Um, at Mozilla, we're working on um, a lot of things. And one of these is the web API effort. Um, and this is basically um, our way of sort of working out what we would need to implement in JavaScript to create a working phone environment. And that was the sort of the basic uh, idea behind Boot to Gecko and where this all came from. Um, this is known in, in other sort of camps as like um, the device um, APIs working group, things like that, DAP. Um, but it's pretty much the same stuff. And it's all about accessing like hardware via JavaScript. Um, so yeah, this is an illustration from a website called, um, R, what is it, Are We Mobile Yet? Um, which is a, a kind of cool visualization of the, all the parts of a mobile phone that we're working on and the implementa implementation status of that. So things with green icons are implemented and things with red icons are sort of being worked on or are yet, not yet sort of there. Um, so there's a whole bunch of those. I'm not going to go through absolutely every single one, but I thought we'd cover sort of a few of um, the favorites, a few of the bigger ones. Um, and you can find the rest of the, uh, the web APIs in more detail, and there's a link in the slides that we'll put online afterwards um, that you can go through. So um, the first one is kind of not really a, a web API as such, is um, touch events. Um, JavaScript, you kind of need to have touch events if you want to have a mobile phone environment built with JavaScript. Um, there's been support recently landed in um, Gecko for multiple touch and that kind of stuff and uh, gestures. So it's important to have that functionality, and that's fully supported now. Um, so you can now have that pinch zoom, all that kind of fancy stuff that you want to have. So if you want to just do pinch zooming in, in, on a website, you just use like CSS transitions with the um, positions of your pinch previous and, and afterwards. And there you go. You've got zoom, a nice smooth zooming transition um, with JavaScript. Well, the fun thing about touch events is as well that uh, it breaks open a whole new market for people. I mean, kids nowadays, we probably all saw the video of that kid that had a magazine and tried to zoom into it and scroll it and got confused, poor kid, uh, <laughs> rich parents. Um, and we need those kind of things because it's the, the, the being on par with native uh, environments, we really have to support these. And it was the original touch support on the Android browser, for example, or on the Firefox browser for Android was just not good enough. What fascinates me is that iOS has 11 touch points. Who's got 11 fingers? But fair enough. So camera API was something we needed for years and years and wanted to have, yeah? The question was if we had any, uh, if there are standardized touch events and there are standardized gesture events. And the, uh, the answer is yes. There's a few companies working on that. We proposed a few of them, but Apple actually uh, uh, had a lot of standards already supported by other people as well. So we're looking into the what's been done in native so we don't have to reinvent that, but make these open web standards as well. Yeah, it will. Uh, there's on touch start, on touch end, and on drag at the moment. The API is a bit odd in 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 places, but uh, you basically have an array of touch points that you get in the browser, so you know how many fingers have been there. In the past, it has been flaky, but with the new multi touch, it's much much better. Microsoft goes another way with the pointer events API, which is another interesting one that actually just tells you something happened and it tells you what the input was. Was it a touch? Was it a mouse? Was it a Kinect or whatever it was? So there's a bit of a race between those two standards. I don't care. I love open web standards. So let's see which one is going to be the best. And I really like Kinect ideas as well and facial recognition, these kind of things. It comes with all the creepy security and privacy <laughs> things. It's wonderful. Uh, talking of which, camera API. Um, camera API was a big one because uh, if you cannot take a picture on your phone and put that into a web app, then basically you will never be able to, to get rid of native apps. Like we use phones, everything. We take pictures of our food and then we upload them somewhere so people see that we've been eating. It's not for your mom, it's actually showing to your friends. I think my favorite was when Instagram came out for Android and had one tweet that said like, oh my God, now we have to see what poor people eat. Because that was just <laughs> wonderful that people are arrogant enough thinking, oh, I bought an iPhone. I'm now a member of an upper class. So <laughs> sure, let me buy five of you and show you how much better I am. But uh, now we have that. We can basically get camera access from JavaScript 
through a secure layer that tells you like, oh, your camera is being accessed. Because a lot of people always have that issue like, oh my God, my computer's gonna spy on me. And you're like, there's a light next to the camera that tells you when it does. But that's not on every hardware. But on phones, for example, it's good to see, okay, this site is trying to access the camera. Do you wanna allow it to? Much like you do with geolocation as well. So that was a big thing. So now we can actually get, get access to the camera. And once we have access to the camera, we have access to the image data. So we can easily manipulate that image data on a pixel level with canvas, or we can actually just put it into a gallery, or we can put filters on it and get $1 billion from some other company buying us. But I don't <laughs> think that's going to work anymore. So one of the, the more sort of phone-related APIs is the WebSMS API. Um, and this is basically not as, as glamorous as something like the camera API, um, but it allows you to send text messages using a simple JavaScript API. So just by providing a phone number and a text message, you can send a message to that number. Um, it's as simple as that, really. And I mean, you basically you saw a very um, blurry view of that SMS app working. Um, if you want to have a look at it later, you can have a look on the phone. Um, but yeah, it's the, the whole point of these APIs is to be as simple as possible. And this is really one of the most simple, um, simple ones. But it's one that you inherently need if you want to have a phone, particularly if you're not using things like um, iMessage and stuff like that, which you have on other platforms. Which, funnily enough, ties into the other thing that is this phone that everybody of you probably has a phone that's shaped like that icon. <laughs> Actually, my hotel has a few, so I'm like, what the hell is going on there? But yeah, it's the same thing there. With one JavaScript call, I can initiate a call to a telephone number, and that was completely impossible before Boot to Gecko and the web APIs. And I think it's a very, very important step to actually realize. I could, for example, in, um, in Boot to Gecko, as it's a completely open system, I could recognize when I'm roaming. And instead of just doing the normal telephone call through the mobile phone provider and paying roaming access, I could go through um, something like Skype or I could go through, through some other provider to make sure I don't pay through the nose while I'm actually just trying to call somebody. And that is something that is not possible that easily in other systems. You have to do that by hand. But a Boot to Gecko phone, having access to that hardware and allowing me to initiate calls through a JavaScript API could test if I'm not actually on my normal SIM connection and then go through some other system in a few lines of JavaScript rather than in calling yet another app. And if you ever tried copying and pasting a telephone number from the contacts on Android into Skype, that is not fun. <laughs> copying and pasting on the phone generally isn't. But we can do that on a hardware level and on a, uh, on a JavaScript level. And it's just a single call. And it's just wonderful to do these kind of things. So one of my favorite ones is the Web Vibration API, um, which was previously known as the Web Vibrator API. Um, but the name had to be changed, um, probably for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, I, I like this API not just because of the name, but also because it's one of the ones that um, helps me sort of get a better idea about how cool these kind of technologies are in that it's quite a simple API. It just affects the vibration motor. But it's one of the ones that brings the web into the physical world. And I really like the idea of like being able to write some JavaScript out, a really simple line of JavaScript. And then it's actually making the device move across the table, which feels weird. But I'm used to like building websites and stuff. And now being able to like control the hardware on a phone and actually see it do something is kind of cool. So I like that API. Um, and definitely, like that, that's actually working in like, uh, Android as well, Firefox and Android. So if you want to play with that and you don't have a access to something with Boot2Gecko Gecko on it, then you can definitely play with these um, these APIs and this one in particular today. Um, so definitely give that a go if you really want. Um, Web NFC API is, is really really cool, and I'm quite sure that at Google I/O we're going to hear a lot about <laughs> NFC, about payment systems, and these kind of things. I, for example, have these business cards right now, which is me holding a unicorn. But actually, what they also do is, like, if I just touch my phone on it, I get my data directly into the phone without you having to type the number in or anything like that. And this is what NFC is about, near-field communication. So instead of having to find my camera and take a picture of that 2D barcode that actually never, ever works, I just basically touch one phone to another one or to a system that has a chip in like these cards have and I can get that data into the phone or go to a URL or download something. And it, for payment services, is absolutely nuts. This is going to be really, really interesting. And we will see uh, what's coming out of that one. So NFC API is supported right now, NFC natively supported right now on Android uh, Nexus S and Nexus S2. And uh, iPhone 5 is rumored 
to be it as well, but we asked, so we looked at Bugzilla, they don't have any <laughs> interest there. So um, NFC is going to be a big one, and uh, it's good that there is an open web API for that one as well now. The button is still red, so there's no support in it right now in Boot to Gecko, but we've got a room full of developers here, so you can fix <laughs> that for us, and we're happy and say thank you if you do. So one of the other ones that isn't quite yet supported, but is equally as interesting as um, Web Bluetooth. So this is the idea of being able to, um, through JavaScript, connect to Bluetooth devices and communicate, um, sending data to and from them. So I'm really interested to see um, what people use once they've been given a more general API that doesn't really do one specific thing, but it allows you to sort of, it unlocks the opportunity to, to connect to as many different devices as you want and kind of uh, interface with them in, in ways that the API didn't envisage. Um, there's also one that isn't quite um, at the same status as Web Bluetooth, which is also equally interesting to keep an eye on, which is Web USB, which is the ability to use JavaScript to communicate with um, USB devices. So has anyone here heard of um, Arduino, which is like DIY hardware, yeah. Um, it would be kind of interesting to see if you could communicate with those devices using JavaScript using something like Web USB. So this is kind of, um, although these are all related to Boot to Gecko in this talk, it's interesting to see how these APIs could be used outside of that and to communicate with devices like Arduino to sort of bring, um, like I was saying with the vibration um, API, to bring web technologies into the physical world. I think that's really interesting. and I'd love to see that sort of happen um, in the near future. The battery API, when that one came out, we were just like, okay, that's, yeah, fair enough. It's good <laughs> to get access. Why would I want to know the battery status from a website or <laughs> from a, an HTML app? But if you think about it, before you start that interface with lots and lots of great animations and gradients and really heavy things, and you realize that the poor guy is already on 5% of the battery, you maybe give them a slighter interface, an interface that is not as hungry. You don't do a, 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 an animation from one state to another, but you just do a plop animation like we do for Internet Explorer 6 and other things that should have died years ago. <laughs> and so the benefit of that one is that we finally know how much the battery is there and actually we can actually measure before and after we do something if we drain the battery and do some testing with that as well. So for performance testing and people get very excited about painting graphs to each other and getting, getting better at that, this is a great API to play with as well. And just on a side note here, the battery is really, really annoying to drain. So make sure that you use the best things on the new systems that we have, which is don't use set timeout, use get animation frame, because then, first of all, the animation will be smoother, the battery will not be drained to death when there's no animation to possible even, and if the tab is not open, it will not do the animation. That's a wonderful thing to do, but that's another talk, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's the kind of stuff I talk about with games. But it's, yeah, it's completely related. Like, basically, using like request animation frame allows you to sort of put the browser in control of things like animation and um, makes it much smoother and just, yeah, saves battery life. Um, kind of related on the graphics side of things is the full screen API. So is anyone using this in JavaScript today? couple people, that's cool. So it basically allows you to um, expand a specific um, DOM, ele DOM element to the full screen um, on any on devices or on the desktop or whatever. So you've probably seen that already with like um, going to actual full screen mode for the whole browser on the desktop, which kind of breaks the entire experience for every website that you're on and all the tabs. Um, if you just want to have full screen for something like a video or a canvas element, then you would use the full screen API to do that. And this is um, important on boot to gecko mobile devices because if you want to have like a, a sort of immersive app like experience you don't want to have it sort of um, sitting um, in a small sort of box in the middle of the already small window and then um, have like this menu bar on top which has got like the time and stuff you might want to actually open that as a proper full screen app so that's how you can do that and that's the technology that we're using on boot to gecko to open these applications up because they're just websites open these applications up as full screen elements um, to give them that immersive experience you normally get on native um, platforms. A screen orientation was a big thing as well and that has been around for quite a while as well. I mean we had the normal orientation APIs which are again event handlers in the browser and weren't supported on the Android browser but were supported on Firefox for Android which you can download today. Um, <laughs> 
for quite some while. So I get the alpha, the beta, and the gamma, or whatever those three are, to actually know what the phone is doing at the moment. And for games, that's just incredible. Mm -hmm. And also, just as a side note, if you build apps for, uh, for mobile devices, take as much as the mobile phone can do for you and put it in your device. Like, an orientation is a wonderful thing, a wonderful, very physical thing for people to do. Like, having some buttons that are small that you have to click are not as much fun. So with the screen orientation uh, API, we extended this idea of just getting the orientation of the phone to also tell us what the, uh, that we can lock the orientation to either portrait or landscape, if your application only makes sense in one of them, and also detect what the original, uh, the, 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 the meant orientation of the device is. Like for a phone, it will always be, it will always be like portrait, but some, for example, a tablet is normally used in landscape. So some of these devices will also tell you what the best orientation for them is. And that's all part of that screen orientation API. So that has been hammered out a bit more than the W3C standards were before about just screen orientation. And on some devices, you have to hack with like resize event of the window. And we shouldn't have to hack these things. The days of Internet Explorer 6 are over. We should be allowed to develop nowadays and not just hack around problems. Yeah, and on uh, Firefox Mobile, we recently landed um, screen orientation locking. So you can now actually lock specific DOM elements um, to a specific orientation when you're using the full screen API. So it's particularly important for what we're doing with web apps in that if you want to have a game, for example, open up full screen and be landscape mode, and they're holding it in portrait mode, you don't want it to be sort of all flipped around and do some weird stuff when you move it back around. So if you use the full screen API to sort of open it out, and then you use the, uh, the screen orientation locking, which is just a one-line piece of JavaScript, then you can lock that application so it opens up in the right ori orientation in full screen mode, which is incredibly important when you want to sort of have that unbroken immersive experience for apps. Um, something else which isn't, again, uh, a, d a device API, um, but is also incredibly m interesting um, and something you briefly saw in the Boot Gecko demo is WebGL. So the ability to have, like, hardware accelerated graphics on a mobile device is pretty interesting, particularly when it's using JavaScript. And when the entire phone's built using JavaScript, that's even more interesting. So for example, you could have WebGL hardware accelerated 2D or 3D graphics in your lock screen or in your um, home screen or whatever. Like, You can use these technologies in all aspects of the phone. You don't just have to use these in a specific application. So there's so much. Um, more to these relatively simple technologies that we're used to on the web once you start unlocking them and actually building an entire hardware platform using them. Um, so I just thought it was quite interesting to sort of talk about that briefly. Um, do you want to talk briefly? Yeah, uh, the biggest problem, of course, is now, uh, yeah, great. You do all these things in the browser, and you still have to go into the browser of the phone, not in Boot Gecko, but for example, on uh, Firefox for Android. And the big thing is apps. Everybody wants apps. Everybody is amazed by apps. And uh, all the apps out there are basically in some market and not on the web. So we needed to find a way to actually allow you to have all these wonderful open things and build real applications on these technologies as well. So instead of having to uh, write HTML, JavaScript, and uh, CSS, and then use uh, Cordova or use PhoneGap to turn that into an iPhone app and hopefully get it submitted to the store, put it into the Play app, and hopefully for have it found between the 6,000 fart apps and <laughs> Angry Bird app clones out there, we had to find a way to allow you to turn a web interface or a website into an app without having to go through these extra processes because we just want to have the web on the phone without going through an install or uninstall process that is not part of the web interface that you originally have. And that's why we built a, uh, an infrastructure of open web applications around these as well, which of course are mostly targeted at boot gecko so you can get your app fix out there. Because end users don't care if there's open technology or not, they just want to have their apps. And that's why we had to build something like that for you as well. Mm. And it's important with apps like particularly when they're built using these web technologies like and the openness, it's, it gives you more reach. So it allows you to um, create these experiences that use a single code base that run across sort of multiple devices, multiple form factors, desktop, mobile, tablet, and all that kind of stuff, which is really interesting. Um, but also, it's, it's also interesting because uh, they're using these open technologies, so um, like your HTML5, CSS, JavaScript. And 
they're the same things that you're currently using to build websites. So you don't need to relearn anything if you're already building websites using these technologies. You don't actually need to do anything special to turn a website into an app. Um, I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. And the other thing is it gives you um, freedom of choice. Um, so the idea of these open web apps is not just to sort of create apps in JavaScript, but sort of the bigger picture of um, putting developers and users back in control of applications. So developers can now be in control of where they distribute their apps, how they distribute their apps, um, how they charge for that, where they charge for that, um, how they communicate with their customers and all that kind of stuff. So they can now like distribute their app on any app store if they really wanted to, or they could sell it through their own website. They're completely in control because these technologies are fully open, and the APIs behind these web apps are fully open as well. So that's why we have the Mozilla Marketplace, and it's right now open for developers, so you can actually start writing HTML5 apps. It's just a manifest file, like you had in other, uh, in other package formats as well. You just set that in there. In the manifest file, you define what your application needs. That's all the security settings in there for you, rather than like, oh, any, anything could now set the data in the background and send text messages. Not possible, because you get asked to give them access to that. And you can actually start, uh, uh, start creating your own marketplace uh, things in there as well and actually distribute from your own sites as well. So there's a, a model much like Air was in the past that you just have a button to install it from your website rather than going through the whole market. So this is right now in developer beta. So uh, it's, it's not for end users yet, but we uh, are seeding these with lots of partners already to build a few apps in there. And the documentation is out there that you can actually start writing your apps. And I think a lot of you here will be more interested in doing that than ha hacking on Bootu Gecko itself, because that's not really, we don't want you to build your own phones. We actually bring these phones to people. And the target market right now is Brazil, where people actually have millions of phones. And they're really horrible, horrible old feature phones that just basically, yeah, you can club people to death with them because <laughs> they don't break, but they're not fun to use. So we actually partnering with a big telephone provider there, which is funnily enough called like a telephone. <laughs> and they are actually bringing out the device. So they're doing the hardware. They're doing a lot of the, uh, in the, of the interface together with Gaia. And we are very lucky to have them. And it was very lucky to, I was at over the air in London the other day, the biggest mobile event there. And the guy from that company that gave the talk said like, we wanted for two years to have a web enabled phone. And then we finally got the budget internally to start doing it. And a day later, my, uh, a day later Mozilla said that they're going to do a web phone. And we said, OK, there's no way we can compete with those, because who knows the web more than Mozilla does. And we were like, oh, this, this was gorgeous. <laughs> so they're partnering with us on this. So uh, that's what the marketplace is going to as well. So if you don't know Portuguese yet, there's going to be a lot of Portuguese documentation of our English documentation being done <laughs> at the moment. And it's just great to, I'm going to go to Brazil for a few weeks to go at several conferences and do hack days there. So yeah, I put the redhead guy in the sun. It's a very <laughs> clever idea. So yeah, I just want to sort of go through a little bit of like how to get started with these web apps. Because like I said, it's pretty simple. Like if you know, if you already got a website, which I imagine most of you do, then you really don't have to do anything that special. Um, it's just a case of understanding some of the new features that are, we're being adding uh, into Firefox. Um, yeah, basically apps are just a website. So all of those apps you saw on the Boot to Gecko phone earlier, like as special as they look, they are literally just websites being visualized in a specific way because of a single JSON file that's sort of telling the phone or the browser sort of how to represent it. Um, so yeah, if you already know how to make a website, then making a web app is a complete breeze. And it's all because of that application manifest. So all you need to do to turn any website today into, a, an, into an app is just include one JSON file. And this JSON file just describes the application. So it's the, the title, the um, description, some of the icons in various sizes, um, where it can be installed from, and that kind of stuff. And then once you have that, then the browser can be told sort of where to look for that. Um, and we'll know how to install it and what it's called and the icons and all that kind of stuff. And then it gets displayed in a nice home screen on a phone. On your uh, desktop um, browser, then it's displayed in however the, the browser decides to display uh, the apps using that information that it's got. Um, and there's a few requirements when sort of using these manifest files. Um, it's pretty basic, but it's important to know. One of them is that you have to have the manifest file hosted on the same domain as the web app, which is kind of straightforward. Um, and it's just basically a security sort of um, feature that sort of allows, uh, sorry, stops people from 
um, faking your web apps and sort of making these manifest files to install, say, um, cut the rope on a device that wasn't built by Microsoft or things like that. But we've uh, been Crazy adding, talk. yeah. <laughs> so we've been um, using these sort of things to prevent people from being able to do that in um, sort of the real world, <laughs> which is the best way of describing it. Um, so if you just push devices as a developer to the phone, you have pretty much sort of open access to it and you can do whatever you want. Like what we're doing with just the cut the rope demo was just using an iframe in an app to sort of point to cut the rope and then display that, um, which was an interesting demo because it showed us um, how little you need to do to some of these um, canvas-based games to actually have them working really well on a, a JavaScript-based device. Um, that was the purpose of the cut the rope demo. But you probably don't want people doing that if you've made like a really cool game. You don't want people making money off that game by selling their own apps sort of with their own manifest file pointing to your website. So these sort of uh, requirements are sort of hoping or will sort of um, prevent that from happening. And one of the others is a pretty sort of basic one as well. It's just providing that manifest file with a specific content type. Um, if you know how to set up a server, it's pretty simple to do. Um, if you um, want to use things like GitHub, we've actually worked with GitHub to, um, if you host uh, application files on GitHub, um, on GitHub pages, then it automatically gets provided by um, the right content type. So long as you um, name it as .webapp, um, and the JSON file that is is .webapp, and then it will do everything for you. Um, uh, go on. Now. now. It, on GitHub, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the GitHub functionality, yeah, we worked with them pretty early on, and they did it in like five minutes. They're really cool guys. So um, yeah, if you just want to quickly hack together an app, then use GitHub pages just to quickly get it working and then try it out. Um, and if you want to have a look at how your manifest file actually works and you just want to make sure it's working, there is a manifest validation tool, um, which is at appmanifest.org. And they get all the links for these, um, everything we've talked about are in the slides, which we'll put online. Um, but definitely go on there if you just like have an issue with it and you just want to make sure it's all sort of formatted correctly. Um, and just to quickly sort of go through the last bits and web apps, um, one of the other things is like once you've created this JSON file is how do you install it? And once you've done that, the, it's basically up to the browser to sort of work out how to do that. But as a developer, you need to do this one specific thing. And to do that, you just need to basically call this um, install method on these this new apps. Um, API. And what you do is you just provide it the manifest file that you just created. And then if, if you call that from your own website, then um, you'd be able to install applications from your own website. Otherwise, you could, um, that's taken control of by like the marketplaces, like the Mozilla marketplace will do that for you. So you don't have to worry about that as a developer. You just sort of inst uh, add your application to this marketplace and then it's all done for you. Yes. The, so this API here, um, yeah, this API is um, in Firefox now. So you can, it's actually in Firefox nightly today. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Um, so yeah, and what you'd get in Firefox today is something like that. And that is a basically just a little door hanger. And once you've clicked on the install, um, sort of provided that install um, call, then it pops up that door hanger automatically in the browser, and the browser now knows what to do with this application. It's just asking for permission to install that app. And then once you've done that, then you basically get um, this native experience that we're looking at. Um, I suppose, do you want to talk briefly about WebRT? Um, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing that we, that we expected from Air in the past, that basically we have an application that you install on your desktop or on your mobile phone, so instead of instead of having to have an index HTML, they have to double click, you just get the same install process that if you had downloaded a DMG file on a Mac or an EXE on Windows, you just, it goes into your applications folder, there's gonna be an icon on your desktop, and you can launch it from the dock in, uh, in OS X, for example, and there is no browser UI on the whole thing. So you have a full screen app that looks like any other, but it's just made with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and how cool is that? It's basically like HTA was an Internet Explorer 4 and 5 without all, without all the security holes that we had back then. And um, yeah, you can see that it's an immersive experience that you don't want an app to be in the browser with all your toolbars and all the annoying things. You want to have a full screen app that really feels like a full screen app. And also it's just in on the desktop because end users, again, don't know the difference between them. Actually, the other day I was in the Apple store here and I had to hear one of those poor uh, uh, geniuses 
explaining to somebody what the difference between an app icon and a photo file is. And people just see big shiny icons and wonder why one thing does something else and the other one. So we want to make sure once they learn that, we, they don't have to unlearn something or learn something new about web apps, because in the end it's apps, and sooner or later everything will be web, believe me. <laughs> yeah. So the question was if, uh, if we're going to have something like extensions for these native apps that actually allows you in context to, add, to extend the functionality of these app or even talk to other applications uh, on the same device, much like browsers had extensions before that made browsers give, give browsers functionality that was not there out of the box. Um, I think the short answer is no. And the reason is because this is web applications that could talk to each other over the web. And the problem with this kind of paradigm of making extensions of native applications is uh, compl the complexity is too high. You, it's the same like writing word macros is not for everybody out there. But it's, it's interesting for a few people and it's interesting for selling those inside that. So it's up to the web application developer to, uh, to build an own infrastructure in there to allow for extensions. But it's an interesting concept. We could actually tie the extension libraries that we have for Firefox into the applications and offer that as an, uh, as an opportunity for HTML app developers. I don't see many people going for that though because it makes much more sense to have a server and get the data from that. And that's something that I, for example, now really don't like about native experiences. When there's a new level out of Angry Birds, I have to download 15 meg of data over my data plan rather than just getting a new level as a JSON object. And with a web app, that would be much, much easier to do with a nice server and you for example wrote that rockets uh, um, canvas game that actually stored uh, the, the, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your, your scores on a server rather than on the machine itself so you actually can have a high score list so instead of extending this game extra with an extra level it's a level of complexity that I don't think many web apps have done yet but I think if everything becomes a web app, as you, uh, as, as you alluded to, then it's definitely something interesting. I haven't seen, for example, Chrome do it yet either with the, Chromes, with the Chrome apps or the Chrome books. But it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go back to that, I'm quite sure as well. And sort of something related to that that might be useful to you is, um, have you heard of web intent? Um, yeah. Web intent. Uh, it's, we call it web activities, but it's commonly known as web intent. And it's basically a bit the ability to um, basically give an application or a website a sort of a purpose. So like Flickr would be for photo sharing or uh, YouTube for video sharing, that kind of stuff. And when another app needs to um, upload a video or upload a photo, it can hook into the intent of Flickr. Um, the browser already knows that it had that intent, like Flickr already told it. Um, so when you go to upload a, a video or a photo from a different application, your browser knows the kind of services that you already use based on those intents and can communicate with them via uh, web intents or web activities um, to sort of share that functionality between the various applications. So it's sort of a, it's not qu quite exactly what you were saying, but it's... Well, yeah. yeah, and that's very important in terms of security as well. The biggest issue about native applications was through that sharing of, uh, of access, one, uh, one app being compromised could then get access to the old operating system, install other applications, and that's why on the web and with, with web technology, we, we, make it make, we make sure that they can't talk to each other without you knowing. We don't want malware on boot to gecko uh, and on HTML5. And that's, uh, I mean, we can say like, oh, with, with great access comes great uh, responsibility and these kind of things, but that's exactly what web intents do. The other thing about web intents, what really excites me, is that I keep it to the user to do the things that they want to do. I just want to say store photo. I don't care where they store the photo. I just took a photo with, with Canvas and the, uh, the camera API and the end user has a Flickr account, has a Instagram account for now, has a Facebook account, all these things. And I don't want to know what services this person uses. On a web app in the past, like on a web app in the browser, I would have to authenticate with all of these different services for on behalf of the user, and there was a lot of like problems coming from that. So with web intents, it's basically saying like, I store a photo, and I don't care what you use. It's up to you to do that. You can put it up on S3 or on Google Pages if you wanted to. It's your choice and your responsibility to put it wherever you think is, is right. And the magic that we had with native apps, and we still have, that a lot of resources are being shared can be rather dangerous and with a system that is inherently as distributed as the web it could be a very very big security hole. 
Um, the other thing about web intents, what is really useful about this is like it's the same we do on a desktop. When I double click an HTML file, it opens in Firefox for me. It might operate in Opera or in Chrome for other people. So again, it's up to the user to use the tools that they want to have to display some kind of technology or some kind of data. So it's a very, very cool way of distribute uh, of disconnecting the intent of the user with the system that you don't need access to and you don't want access to because once one of those gets compromised they could talk to the other one and this way it always goes through the user to say yes or no and realize what's going on uh, so the question was um, with technologies like web intents how does that work with sort of offline um, myself I don't actually know how, how we're working with offline specifically for web intents um, we do have like right so I mean we do have offline API's like so you can basically store data offline and that kind of stuff to sync up afterwards um, but specifically for web intents I'm not too sure what the actual approach is um, for the ability to use those offline um, specifically because I suppose the idea is that it's sort of a web application API to hook into sort of like things like photo sharing and stuff like that now I, I need to look into um, how that would work offline, speci specifically if you're just using offline functionality in that other web application that you're hooking into. If you still want to use web intents, that would be kind of useful. Right, yeah, so um, the second part of that question was like, how, how could you use something like web intents to go from, say, a photo taking application to a photo editing ap application? Um, I don't know the specifics of that process, but that's something we're looking into a bit to Gecko. We're using that to get from, for example, the home screen um, of be to Gecko to the camera application. So there's a little camera icon at the bottom. And if you click that, then it will sort of use web intents to get into the camera application and encourage that to open. So the specifics of that, I think, we're being worked on. There's a lot of stuff that we're working on specifically for Boot to Gecko because we're coming across these situations like that where it wasn't necessarily um, described in the specification. So we're sort of working as we go, but I think we'll sort of get a, a, a consistent approach as Boot to Gecko sort of gets nearer. Yeah, there's going to be quite a few. I mean, uh, web intent is actually a, a lot of uh, pursued by Google, so I can ask some really good questions at Google. I will derail them on stage tomorrow. <laughs> uh, and but it's a JavaScript API, so you have to you have an error callback handler as well. So if you were offline and you wanted to share, and it says like, oh, I can't share, your app could offer, shall I store it in local storage or in an index DB database until you go online, and you have an API to detect if you're online as well, and an API to detect the speed that you have. So one thing, for example, that drives me nuts on Twitter on Android is when I take a picture and then it gets stuck there for five minutes, not uploading the picture before Twitter times out and says like, I saved it to drafts for you because I can't use the gallery in between. So a clever way of programming that would be like, okay, you're actually on a really, really bad connection as in everywhere in San Francisco and you try to upload this right now, maybe it's not a good idea, store it locally, and then when you're fast enough, I give you an alert that it's now ready for uploading. So that's up to the app developer again as well. But yeah, web intents by definition are for web interactions. <laughs> so being online is probably a good idea for web interaction. Um, so we just sort of go through the last sort of pits um, here. So. We sort of describe sort of the technologies that are involved in boot to gecko and sort of what they mean and sort of that kind of stuff. Um, if you actually want to start using boot to gecko today, there's a few options available to you. Um, one of those is if you know how to use Git um, and um, you know where to get Firefox nightly, which is pretty simple, um, you can actually just run Gaia, the, the front end operating system, which is probably what most of you are interested in, um, in Firefox nightly because it's just websites and web applications and all those APIs are built into Firefox nightly. Um, the pros of that so, uh, solution is that it's um, pretty simple to set up, um, it's easy to sort of develop with and you can use the development tools to sort of test your applications and that kind of stuff. Um, the cons is basically that it's um, a little bit finicky with like um, viewport sizes and stuff, so you're not necessarily going to have, you're going to have to sort of resize the browser into the right viewport size and that kind of stuff. We're working on better ways of doing that right now, but this is probably the easiest way to get started with Boot to Gecko. Or you use the dev tools with the, uh, with the responsive view. Yeah, so something um, Christian just reminded me of that we've recently landed in um, our developer tools in Firefox is the ability to have sort of this responsive um, mode. So you can actually change the um, viewport size without resizing the entire browser, and it just changes the basically the, the main view of the website that you're on, and you can change it to like specific phone 
dimensions and that kind of stuff. And we're working on the ability to have like um, custom dimensions and stuff like that, which would be kind of cool. Um, related to that, there's also something that um, is on GitHub, which is Gaia Dev Server, which is a little Node.js um, server setup that just allows or sort of eases this process of sort of getting up to speed with like installing Gaia and um, testing web apps and that kind of stuff just in Firefox nightly quickly. So definitely check that out if you're interested in doing this. Um, it's pretty easy to set up and it's kind of cool. And the final sort of view that you'll get when you finish with that is just basically a nightly browser with Guy running fully. Obviously, you're not going to get access like the phone APIs and SMS a APIs and stuff like that, but you get access to the web apps and that kind of stuff. So if you're just building web apps and you want to test it out in the Gaia environment, then you can use something like this. Um, the other one is the Boot to Gecko simulator. So um, we're also calling this Boot to Gecko on desktop. It's basically just like the um, nightly version you just saw, but actually sort of um, with the consistent viewport size and all the sort of um, browser related bits that you don't need to worry about sort of stripped out. So it's, it's just running Gecko in, in the background and it's basically just like WebR2 just sort of running in a frame. Um, but it has a little bit more um, security access and um, a few more APIs that you sort of have access to. So it's a little bit more of the boot to Gecko experience. Uh, right now it's a little bit um, tricky to install and we're working on a much easier process to get that running. You basically need to know how to build um, Mozilla Central, which is the core sort of um, code base for Firefox. Um, but if you know how to do that and you're happy to sort of play around with that, then you can do that today. That's probably the, the best sort of mid-ground mid solution for getting to grips with Boot to Gecko and Gaia right now today. Um, the last one is actually putting Boot to Gecko on your own device. So if you're comfortable with sort of screwing around with your phone um, and it's not necessarily your primary device, I just have to put that disclaimer in there, um, you have perhaps um, what the devices that we support right now are like the, um, the Nexus and the um, Galaxy S2. Um, if you have one of those devices just lying around and you want to try this out today, you can do that. The code has been on GitHub for like, like Christian said, like over eight months now. Um, and all you need to do is just follow the MDN documentation and just follow the build process we tried to make this build process as simple as possible. Um, we've updated it in the last like few weeks. So if you've tried Boot to Gecko before and you found it a little bit tricky, um, which it was when it started, the build pr process is much, much simpler now. So I definitely advise you to check it out again. Uh, we're also working on thinking about uh, actually uh, flash devices in the offices of Mozilla as well. So we would have a laptop there with a button saying like connect phone, put Boot to Gecko on there and then you can try it out that well. So uh, we're setting this up in London right now, so if you know cheap flights and you <laughs> want to go to London during the Olympics, which probably is not going to happen, cheap flights, but uh, <laughs> I'm talking to the team today here as well because this to me is what really should be doing it because, uh, yeah, flashing your own phone is not fun and uh, it's, it's installing a lot of stuff on your, on your computer as well. So we actually want to make it much easier in Mozilla offices and also on hack days to actually, uh, to actually flash the phones quickly from a dedicated laptop, which could be a Chromebook or something <laughs> like that, to actually make sure that it, you can try it out. But l let's not forget that like you can run Gaia in the browser in Nightly. So if you yeah. just want to build apps, if you just want to play with the interface itself, you don't need to break one of your phones, because you've got millions of them lying around, of course, being like South Bay rich people as you are. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to. And uh, in the end, this is, uh, this is aimed at not replacing Android and iOS here, but it's actually aimed at devices that are affordable to people. So what we really need for, the, for that is apps, and we really need for people to give us feedback on the APIs so they become really, really interesting for you to use, because we're totally happy if somebody else builds something similar. And there's a few other process uh, program, uh, programs out there, like Tizen, for example, which is another open device uh, uh, idea, but it's actually aiming at the high-end phones, and we're aiming for the low-end phones, because the web is for everybody, and you shouldn't, it shouldn't be for some people that can afford a massively cool new tablet that, that displays pictures that are too big for our 3D, 3G networks. But <laughs> so play with it, but uh, uh, make sure that this is for the hardcore geek ones. You don't have to be that hardcore geek person. You can just use it in your browser as well. And I suppose something that I should probably clarify is if you use Windows, it's currently unsupported as a development environment. Um, <laughs> however... Nice, um, nice office. Yeah, <laughs> it's a lovely <laughs> office. Um, there's nothing to stop you running. So I mean, basically, you can use this in Linux and Mac right now. Um, 
but it's nothing to still be running like Ubuntu in, in Windows environment just to sort of get the build process running. But for example, with the, the nightly stuff, and um, yeah, with the nightly stuff, you don't need to worry about like being on Windows and that kind of stuff. That, that's fully supported, that's absolutely fine. It's just the Mozilla Central building, um, that kind of process. That's currently, we don't have a Windows supported um, environment for that. Um, I don't actually know specifically what the, um, the status of that is yet, but I'll look into that. But yeah, just be aware of that, that you basically need to be using Linux or Mac if you want to actually delve into this a little bit deeper and start building um, boot to gecko from some the core code. Um, I think somebody who wants to build boot to gecko from core is probably a Linux user and very happy to build random things on this machine <laughs> anyways. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the other things, just literally before we wrap up, is um, if you want to sort of get involved in boot gecko then we're, we really want you to do that. We happily encourage you to do that. Um, there's plenty of ways to get involved, whether that's just um, through sort of outreach, sort of talking about it, playing around with it, or actually sort of getting involved in the code. Um, the best way to keep up to speed of things is to frequent the um, mailing list. So there's two main mailing lists. There's a community boot to Gecko mailing list, which is more about sort of the, um, the non-technical side of things. And then there's the, um, the dev boot to Gecko mailing list. And again, the links are in the slides. Um, which is more about the technical implementation and some of the functionality. And if you want to get involved in that, then you can do that. Um, if you want to actually help like submitting code, then jump on the GitHub repository. So um, there's a couple of GitHub repositories on um, uh, mozilla dash um, b to g and there'll be a boot to gecko repository in that channel, and also a Gaia repository. And there'll be loads of issues and stuff. If you want to get involved and start submitting some code to, for pull requests, get involved and do that today. That'd be really helpful. Um, and the last thing really is to talk to us. Like, if you want to get in touch with anyone at Mozilla, the best place to look is on, uh, on IRC. We pretty much live on there. Um, so irc.mozilla.org is where you want to go. Um, there's a few channels that you might be interested in. There's um, HashBeat2G, um, which is mainly for the, the lower level sort of implementation stuff. There's HashGaia for the sort of operating system stuff, the graphical side of things. Then there's um, hash open web apps if you want to talk about the application APIs and that kind of stuff. Um, and also hash web APIs if you want to specifically talk about some of the, um, the individual APIs that I was um, talking about earlier. Um, I suppose we'll sort of end on this. Like I think with boot to gecko what, what I'm seeing at least is that we're on the threshold of something really, really interesting here. Um, it's, I've not sort of seen a situation where I've been able to do so much with JavaScript and do s sort of so many sort of interesting things with it, like moving the vibration motors and that kind of stuff. That kind of is interesting to me. Um, and I definitely advise you to check out these, this, the Boot to Gecko projects and play with it in, in some sense, whether that's playing on the phones um, after this talk or actually ha giving it a go yourselves. Um, and I'm really interested to see where this goes beyond sort of Boot to Gecko and mobile phones. and like. Perhaps this will be something that we can start using on things like set-top boxes and TVs and like car stereos and whatever. Like the ability to have a consistent sort of platform that's using the same technologies on various different pieces of hardware. I mean, maybe we'll even get those sort of internet-enabled fridges that everyone keeps talking about using sort of boot to gecko and sort of interfacing that with your mobile phone and doing some crazy stuff with web intents. I don't know. Maybe we will. And the, uh, it, it occurred to me after a while, actually, to actually, together with some talk from my colleague Barry Munsterstiger, say here, so you can pester him about this <laughs> as well. And he's like on his playing on his iPhone, damn it. <laughs> um, that this is incredible, because for the first time, as a web developer and somebody who just knows his HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, I can build a phone interface. I can make, customize my phone and not putting like, like stickiest stickers on there and stuff like that, but I can customize the phone itself. And that to me is quite cool and gamey and everything, but say for example you're a company with 500 people that just want to have five apps on there and their logo above it. On an iPhone it would be impossible. On an Android, possibly if you run your own Android mods and things like that, on this it's writing an HTML page and flashing it onto the phone. And this is just, as you said, that's, a, that's something new and something cool coming. Think of a kid's phone with like four buttons saying like call school, call mom, call taxi, call for help, um, <laughs> call I'm hungry, these kind of things. Order a stoner phone like enter pizza, order these kind of things. You could do whatever you want with this interface just thinking about it. We could read out which provider you have at the moment and give you different interfaces for the T-Mobile England and T-Mobile America card. 
So we have a complete opportunity to take the flexibility of the web and what we've done with the web in the last few years and put that on the phone. And this is what Butu Gecko is about, breaking apart that phone barrier <laughs> that we didn't have before. And yeah, we're almost there, so it's all good. I think uh, we need to go. You expect that in a Microsoft building, come on. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry about that. I just filmed for Microsoft. I like those guys, really. <laughs> but um, as I said, this is something for you. You're, you're, not, you're not HTML monkeys anymore that are really annoyed that a rounded corner doesn't show. You have the opportunity to build a phone from scratch without having to know anything about Java, about any of these things. And if any of you are building apps right now, HTML5 apps, you have a chance to put them on a device that will be in the hands of lots and lots of people in the future that actually want to be on the web and can't be right now because they can't afford those expensive phones that we have at the moment. And with that, I think we just thank you and maybe have some more questions if the building is not going to collapse on us or something. <laughs>